Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Today's conversation features record producer Creed Taylor. You know, a lot of the conversations that I've had on The Third Story have been the result of me reaching out to somebody and asking them if they'd like to uh, participate. This one came about a little bit differently. I, uh, I had a correspondence with Creed's grandson. We were connected through a mutual friend, and we started talking about what it might mean to talk to Creed. He's in his late 80s, and he's a name that I haven't really heard much lately. Creed's name uh, appeared on so many classic jazz records. Uh, From the 50s through the 80s, he was one of the most important jazz record producers. He worked at ABC Paramount in the 1950s, eventually started Impulse Records and signed John Coltrane to the label before leaving to go to Verve, where, among many others, he produced classic albums for the likes of Bill Evans and Stan Getz. One of those Stan Getz projects would become the Getz Gilberto album, the one that brought Bossa Nova and the girl from Ipanema to the world stage. And that was a big deal to me. At the end of the 1960s, he left Verve to start his own CTI label, which would release an incredible collection of beloved albums, some of them successful as crossover projects. The roster included Wes Montgomery, George Benson, Grover Washington, Freddie Hubbard, Grant Green. In many ways, the sound of the 1970s was defined by CTI. So I was excited to meet him, and there was an element of the unknown in this experience because I had no idea what to expect. All the same, what I discovered was unexpected. One of the things that really stayed with me was talking about certain well-known musicians and in what way their artistry and personalities were similar and what ways they were different. I think Creed himself is an example of someone whose professional output was very broad and revealed a real sensitivity to music and historical context. He was a fan. His personal dynamic was a bit more of a mystery. In other words, people are not always who they appear to be based on their music. And Creed Taylor is no exception. Without any further preamble, here's my conversation with producer Creed Taylor. It's a great, great apartment. I used to live downtown. So how long have you been on the Upper East Side? About a year and a half. But we also, we have a place in Florida. So how much time do you spend in New York now? It's about a half and a half. But I just came back from Germany for a month and a half. We, We travel around and my wife's mother lives in a little... A dwarf, it's called, close to Nuremberg. You know, part of what's so interesting to me about what you've been up to is that, you know, you had a very active 30-year period, and then it's, you know, been a little less active for the last 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering when I was preparing to talk to you, you know, what have you been doing? No, I'm I'm writing a book, traveling a lot. Mm -hmm. I read a lot, too. And we we have a a gym here that's... Great, you know, the treadmill and everything else, and, and a pool. When we talked on the phone the first time, you had a loud record playing behind in the background, and I asked you what you were listening to. You said Kenny Barron. Oh yeah. How often do you put on records and listen to them? Well, I'm fairly constant <laughs> until my wife says, "Would you please turn that down?" You know. Do you listen to the records that you made? Oh, I, I listen to whatever the mood happens to strike me, you know. I certainly listen to a lot of Gil Evans and well, Freddie Hubbard. What is it about Gil Evans now that makes you, you know, keep putting him on and Freddie Hubbard? Well, of course, there are two different elements there. Freddie with his phenomenal ability, which just impresses me every time. As long as I've been recording Freddie, you know, whenever I put a record on by Freddie, it's like, wow, I didn't realize that that was going on, you know? Mm-hmm. Because there's constant, very constant emotional contact with... Well, and w- with Gil, it's um, so many layers of creativity that this guy had. And, you know, it was actually it was later on in uh, my acquaintance with Gil <laughs> that I found out he was uh, arranging for Skinny Annis. If you were to find the most unlikely kind of music that Gil would be doing, and Skinny Ennis, mm. who had a, like a solo vocal kind of thing, got a date with an angel, you know, like a whisper kind of thing, mm-hmm. and the Mickey Mouse figures. But I could still hear Gil, you know, no matter what he was writing, no matter what idiom, you know. You could hear his stamp on the thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that you went to Duke. I'd actually love to talk about the early days of your career a little bit. You moved to New York because you knew you wanted to produce records. You moved here with a dream of producing records. Although you had been a musician, you, you didn't study music in college. 
not formally, I, you know, anyway, the standard college course in music was not something that I could partake of productively. So I majored in psychology. I started out in pre-med, which I began to very quickly abhor organic chemistry. And then I began to like it. Duke was, uh, as you probably know, a, a hotbed of professional musicians, soloists, bands, and uh, Les Brown, Johnny Long, and um, the Duke Ambassadors was <laughs> the ongoing band. We, I was in that in the band while I was there, and and then I uh, took three, four of the guys to a club at uh, Virginia Beach called Bop City, and we played there a the whole summer until two of the guys had to go back for some academic reason, and I joined it. You, you know the term tenor band? Tenor band is uh, another way of describing it as a Mickey Mouse ensemble. It's usually two tenors, trumpet, and uh, rhythm. I, <laughs> I joined it just so I could stay at Virginia Beach and, and play, but uh, and I was hardly a fan of that kind of stuff that was going on then. You know, that, that pop era was like a real Walt Disney world. You know? So this is kind of like a late 40s period, more or less? When was this? Yeah, um, 49, 50. And I got drafted into the Marine Corps halfway through my Duke career. And I luckily got sent to Korea <laughs> with the Marines in combat. That was a year. Then I came back, got out of the Marines at a place called Treasure Island, which is in San Francisco Bay. And uh, every night I would go into San Francisco and hear and meet all these guys. I met Stan Getz with Jimmy Rainey and uh, a rhythm section, but I'd never met him before. And, you know, that was the beginning of that acquaintance. And then I walked a few blocks up the street uh, to the Black Hawk where I uh, heard Paul Desmond and... Paul Desmond and I became very close friends, you know. And, uh, of course, Dave Brubeck, well, he was with Brubeck at that, at that point. I got out of the Marines and came back and took graduate work at Duke and um, announced to my family that I was going to New York, which didn't really go over with a whiz-bang. What impact did being in the Marines have on your decision to move to New York and try your hand at actually being a... A musician or working in music. The Marines have absolutely nothing to do with anything. You know, I was just thinking, you know, you saw combat. I can imagine being on the front lines, you might think to yourself, well, if I make it through this, I'm going to do what I want to do. No, I, I pretty well made up my mind that uh, I'm not going to shoot at them. And if I don't shoot at them, they won't shoot at me. I mean, that's a, a paraphrasing, I think. And I got in, into a few ticklish situations. And then I became a, it was called a forehead observer in Pan Moonjam at a bunker overlooking the entire uh, 38th parallel with the mountains on the north. And, and then I was, of course, in the 38th parallel in the south. <coughs> and I could watch the, uh, the generals and the presidents of the opposing <laughs> directly below. And it was, it was kind of interesting, and then I'd read about it in, in U.S. News and World Report. Oh, you know, I already saw that. You know. <laughs> so when you moved to New York, when you finished your graduate work at Duke and moved to New York, what did you find here? What was the scene like when you landed in the city? Well, I had made one trip prior to the, the main trip, and um, I, I stayed here for a week with uh, someone I knew. And... 52nd Street was on fire. You know the history of it. You could walk into any little club at the base of any brownstone on that whole section and at no charge you could hear Basie, Ellington, Getz, you name it. And that was just, I could hardly wait to get back again. But I always planned to, I wanted to make records, produce records, fired by my dislike of jazz at the Philharmonic. Simple as that. The, the, uh, the long bass solos, the tenor solos, and the, well, you, you name it, drum solos, and the crowd, and all the excitement, and what, what happens to the music, you know? 
I don't I can jazz at the Philharmonic is was for me a circus. One of the other things that happened with jazz at the Philharmonic is that it put the producer in front, and so you understood that there was somebody behind these records. That there there could oh, be a I, producer. I, knew, well, I was well aware it was Norman Graz, who was a showman, mm-hmm. and uh, I imagine he liked. Me. I've only met him once after I had decided to go from ABC to MGM, and MGM purchased uh, Verve, so mm-hmm. I uh, and Norman, of course, left, and I took over that whole thing. And but your desire to make records was a reaction to hearing jazz at the Philharmonic and thinking... It literally was. That triggered the, the, yeah. whole, the whole thing. When you were growing up in Virginia yeah. and listening to jazz, were you hearing it on the radio? Symphony Sid. Sure. And loud and clear, 50,000 watts, you know, whatever it was broadcasting, like Glass Booth, you know about that, right? Anyway, he would describe Dizzy talking to Miles Davis or whoever happened to be working at Birdland, and you could hear the crowd, you know, the background. Wow. So that sealed it for me. I'm going there. Yeah, absolutely. As exciting as it was, was it kind of an insider scene, though? Was it still something that a certain kind of person knew about, but not everybody was hip to? Or was it a more popular form of entertainment in 1950, 1952 in New York than it is today? No, it certainly wasn't a popular form of entertainment. And I, I didn't think about it that way. I thought about it as, that's the way I like jazz. I want to hear the solos, and I want to hear some uh, ensembles that are not cliche-ridden. I was not not at all anxious with the audio quality that was going on. It wasn't just the <laughs> jazz at Philharmonic with a sax player on it on his knees and the tenor up in the air. And I, oh, and, and I, I have to really emphasize uh, Charlie's Tavern, which you know about, right? It just so happened that Bethlehem Records had just started in a, a building a half block from Charlie's Tavern, which of course disappeared many years ago. Mm-hmm. All the musicians went there. The only ones who didn't go there went to a place called the Copper Rail. Actually guys from the uh, Ellington band hung out at the Copper Rail, but but this place was like, uh, you, you could go in and and see Zoot Sim, Chet Baker, and, uh, Al Cohen, whatever. As a matter of fact, I, I took my uh, wind-up record player with me to Korea. I had two records. One, one was the Chet Baker Quartet with Jerry Mulligan, the one. And the other was uh, Al Cohen and Zoot Sims, 12-inch LP. And I could play that while I was attending to my military duties. But... You know, a lot of people talk about the the value and the importance of listening deeply into rec- records. You know, you said something earlier about how every time you hear a Freddie Hubbard recording, you hear something new or you catch something different. Mm-hmm. And that kind of awareness, I think, comes from repeated listening to a record where you can really get in touch with what a player is thinking about how they're phrasing, how they're playing, the ideas, you know. A lot of older people I talk to describe something similar where they had just a handful of records. You remember the two records that you took to Korea and had an impact mm-hmm. on you. And today, of course, we have infinite access to all the music that's ever come before on the internet. You can hear everything. And it's hard to find the discipline sometimes to sit down and just listen to a record over and over again and listen deeply into, into mm. the music. I think it's a difference in the way people are coming to the music today. Oh, sure. I mean, the technology and the electronics, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So how did you go about getting the job at Bethlehem Records? How did one become a record producer in 1950? There was a drummer who uh, talked this this Swiss, uh, young Swiss guy who had money to come here from Switzerland. And he was in the uh, real estate business, sort of. He happened to go to Arthur Murray to learn dancing in a hurry. You know? <laughs> and uh, this drummer from Duke, it was a student at Duke, had a girlfriend who was one of the teachers at the Arthur Murray Studios. And the drummer said, hey, I forget her name. When you uh, go for your lesson, see if you can meet this guy, Gus Wildy, because I think, I think we might talk him into starting a record company. So that happened, uh, to make a long story short, and, and uh, they decided to call it Bethlehem. I walked in to say hello to the drummer, and one thing led to the other, and, and it, conveniently, they were doing everything wrong 
in order to succeed in the record business. They they uh, they made a big band record with uh, Chris Conner. I mean, you know, a big band is the big band. Four trumpets, four trombones, three trombones, mm -hmm. whatever, and saxes and everything. They put it out as a single, all these records as a single, mm -hmm. even though we were right on the verge of the 10-inch LP, which I knew, which somehow they didn't realize that we you have to start with the, the marketplace first, obviously. Any fool should know that. I, I thought, you know. So I, I met, they signed Chris Connor. I think she just come off San Quentin's band, and, and she lived, she had moved to New York. And I started talking to Chris, and, and uh, we were talking about re really good pop songs of the day, you know, and, and I don't know, wow, this, she's got something good. She also had a nice husky sound. And I thought the way to get this Chris Connor recorded is uh, by a, a really scaled down backup and with piano, guitar, and a little bit of drums down there, and make a 10-inch LP and put it in a great looking package. And then I found out all the, this, at that time, all the uh, distributors were on 10th Avenue. And, and the salesman from Bethlehem and I got friendly and he took me over to 10th Avenue. I met all the distributors and I was able to give them a Chris Connor copy. And then I went to NEW with the Chris Connor 10 inch LP. And, to the radio. Yeah. And the, the ra well, I had the, uh, the jock, you could do this nowadays, of course. But I had the jock say, um, you're listening to Chris Conner singing Lullabies Birdland. And we put that as the first cut on the Chris Conner album, so every time they play the album, it would identify the product. Huh. So between the distributors on 10th Avenue and WNEW, I was just able to parlay the, the whole practicality of the... Uh, issue at the moment. That reveals an enormous amount of sophistication about what it meant to make records and also the idea of being a record producer beyond what happened on the date, you know, in the studio, but also what the package looked like, how the record was sequenced, who was aware of it, the tie-in with the radio, making sure the distributors were behind it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a lot of information to be handling for your first project. Well, the motivation, that, as strange as it may be, was if I, I love jazz, and I love music, contemporary music, whether it's jazz or whatever, classical, Debussy, you know. It somehow occurred to me that if I'm going to hear the music I want to hear, I got to figure out a way to make it. And I didn't just walk into a, an environment like that and say, hey, I'm, my name is so-and-so, why don't you let me make some... I, I just very quietly did all of that and, and got to know the distributors. And at the time, the LPs started uh, being manufactured. Some of the uh, pressing plants were not the greatest quality watchers. Uh -huh. So, as a matter of fact, a record got pressed in, built in uh, Bridgeport. And I found out that they'd been melting down old vinyl records and using that as the... Uh, the new with the with the label on it, mm -hmm. which caused uh, you can imagine. Yeah, sure. Talk, talk about I, I don't think they could spell fidelity. You yeah, know? right. So they knew that pressing plant and Columbia was on Columbia that um, we got to stop throwing the scrap records into the vat and melting them down. We take the label off first if this is a Bethlehem record because that guy's looking out for a quality vinyl, pure vinyl. And were you so? Were you concerned with the fidelity? Were you listening to the records and saying this this could sound better? I think this could some records sound better than others. I want this to sound as good as possible. Oh, of course, yeah. But not everybody was. Well, I found out that uh, there was a guy named Tom Dowd. You know the name? Sure. And there was a studio, and it's right off Bryant Park. And uh, I took Chris there with a small ensemble, and and Tom Dowd and I recorded her, and it was great. I mean, pure. Great, with uh, the selections of songs and, and the players, and, and Tom was an amazing, amazing engineer. You know, not long after that, when Tom had gotten a, an offer from Atlantic Records to leave that, I forget the name of the studio that he was working for. But anyway, I, I then was lucky to call Rudy Van Gelder because he had done those records I took to the Korea, except not the, not the uh, Chet Baker Mulligan Quartet, that was... Uh, 
but the Zoot Sims and it's Rudy. My name is. What do you think? Could I book your studio? And at the time, he, he had his studio in his parents. You, you know that story. I do. It was a, his, in his parents' house, right? So. Yeah, it was a very small living room, not, not half half size of this room. In New Jersey? In New Jersey, yeah. And you had to schedule the sessions kind of around his family's life, right? Oh, yeah, because you know, he was still an obstetrician. I mean, <laughs> Can you imagine going to Rudy to get your glasses? And so that went on for maybe a year and a half. So And still when you were at Bethlehem, the, the relationship with Rudy Van Gelder started when you were at Bethlehem. Yeah. Because you liked the sound of the Zoot Sims record. Yeah. It sounded much better than the Chinese shooting at me. <laughs> I only thought about what I liked. I'm looking out for a, a record done with determination, with talent and severity. And... No audience clapping away for the guy playing tenor on lying on his back and da, 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 da. you saw a difference between what a performance for a record and a live performance you you understood that there's a kind of a difference between the way players might perform on stage and how they might bring what they do to the studio well, I didn't think about it that way I just thought about how long is that bass player going to play and why 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 doesn't that the tenor player just go to one of the clubs and, and honk away, but don't bother me with all of that repetitive uh, stuff. You know. But it is interesting because you, you know, eventually started Impulse and before you, you left, you, you signed John Coltrane, which was, you know, at that point, he was playing very extensive solos and the style of music was very exploratory and some of the music that was inherent in the way the music was played. Long solos and, you know, extended. Extended, intensive feeling. Feeling, not honking. I'd been going to the uh, to, to, uh, village of the Vanguard to talk to Coltrane a lot. And I was a real fan of Stan Getz and a most appreciative fan of Coltrane. I knew what it was all about. I understood what it was all about. And John and I had a, a really open discussion about this you know I know what you're all about so I don't want you to think that I flat out enjoy all of the things you do but I understand and I deeply appreciate it but because I didn't want to march in Zach Coltrane you know so we started off with a we understood each other so Coltrane Ray Charles and my favorite Gil Evans Gil and I were like that you know and, and Oliver, Oliver, Nelson Oliver Nelson had had just he, he'd been doing well. Look, he he did the arrangements with Jimmy Smith, "Walking a Wild Side," mm-hmm. a twelve eight time. I never see to never had anything to do with a twelve eight time kind of. But Oliver, you know, he he put that thing together, and "Walking a Wild Side" became a, a smash. You know, mm-hmm. I think the impulse. You know, I keep coming back to this, but the look of the Impulse Records, the sound of the Impulse Records also, it's this extreme stereo, for example. Some of those Impulse Records were some of the first records I heard, certainly later with the Coltrane Records, that were these extremely panned stereo records. It seemed to me the approach around Impulse had its own identity. Then when you went to Verve, those records had a different identity. They still had a, a similar sophistication and a similar quality, of course, but they had a different slant and the way they were approached, the way they were produced, and we all fell in love with labels for different reasons. And I think it's so interesting that you left one to go to another. It was still you, but the record sounded a little bit different when you went from one to the other. Well, for one thing, the movie company had something to do with it. It was either a soundtrack for a movie or the artist who did the soundtrack for his. So it's intermixed that way. Uh huh. What was it like for you to watch impulse grow knowing that you had set it in place and then you you know you were at verve at that time i mean were you watching impulse kind of checking out how it had unfolded yeah <laughs> one thing that bothered me about impulse was when i went to the men's room at um what's called idlewild yeah i looked at the urinal it was made by impulse don't ask me why why oh no what this is i don't need this if anybody finds out that Impulse is actually a toilet fixture in the airport, I'm in trouble. I, I, you know. So is that why you put an exclamation point on the end of it? No, no, no. 
even that was that your idea to put the exclamation point on the end of impulse how did that come about Brian Scott, you know Brian Scott. She's Tony Scott's wife. Actually, I met her at, at uh, in the elevator at uh, Bethlehem with Tony. You know Tony Scott, right? The clarinet player. Yeah, yeah. Good painter too. Tony said, "Where are you going? Are you you going to Bethlehem Records? What? Where did you get that name? Who came up with that ridiculous name?" And Brian Scott said to Tony, "Tony, it's what he, it's the name of the thing's Bethlehem. Get off his back." But that I was very new. I mean, I was just beginning to get uh, settled at Bethlehem. You know? But uh, later on, I became very good friends with Tony. And, and that's how I met Fran, who became my art director at uh, at ABC. And, and she really did all of the... Uh, between Pete Turner, photography, and uh, and Fran Scott, that's that's what happened with that. Uh, the look. The look. And she she knew all the musicians and of course through Tony and and uh, she loved the music. So then ABC came along. They didn't come along. I came along. What happened? ABC was a the huge corporation, movies or whatever, and, and I read Billboard, and I read about the the startup, and I look at uh, Sam Clark. I don't think so. He's an old distributor maybe, and I think he ran a taxi company. But I decided I'd go across the street from Bethlehem, which was uh, not too far down from the Paramount building, and I uh, got an appointment with Sam, and I walked into Sam, hey, Sam, I'd, I'd like to uh, come with the company. What do you think? And Sam said, uh, would you know a good song when you heard it? And I said, of course. Okay, done. That was the interview. <laughs> that was the interview. And then uh, the, the real kicker in that whole thing with ABC was a guy named Harry Levine. He and I got along famously. And um, he booked the Paramount Theater, which meant he booked uh, Betty Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, and Gene Krupa right after he got out of the jug in uh, San Francisco for that horrible thing. And uh, and he booked Sinatra, and he, he was booking all... And, and he loved music, and uh, we were on the same wavelength. And when I went in to do a singer song of Basie, for instance, uh, I'd booked uh, studio singers, the jingle singers, you know, who were about as uh, swinging as a dead grapevine. Uh, it just didn't work at all. I mean, they, you know, they sing about Coca Cola, but they can't come in and sing Basie stuff. So here we had the Basie rhythm, and the engineer, Herb Greenbaum, said, you know, I know you're having trouble with the stiff concept that these jingle singers have. Why don't we just start over dubbing? And he, and nobody really, he, he didn't get credit for it, but uh, we'd already spent, I don't know how much, trying to get these uh, jingle singers to do singles like Basie. You know? And so I... I went to Harry, I said, Harry, I'm, I'm in hot water here. I think we've gone way over budget trying to do this singer song of Basie, but I have another way. And he says, well, go with it. I'll take care of Sam. You don't worry about it. So that became overdub from overdub. That's interesting because I was thinking about the Bill Evans record where he accompanies himself. Conversations, Conversations with myself, yeah. Which is later. Even that, you know, to me, seems like a very early example of overdubbing especially in jazz, and using the technology in a kind of a creative way to embrace the, the sort of ideas of, of Bill Evans, you know, but it's still, it was a technology that later on became a very pop mm -hmm. aesthetic, and we use it all, over and over again today. It's, you can't make a record without an overdub practice. Yeah, well, but, but that, from a music musical standpoint, it was different from the uh, Sing Soul Capace because here you have um, a piano player accompanying himself and doing it a third time, which was good. I mean, obviously, a great record. But with the uh, Sing Song of Basie, you had uh, four trumpets in the Basie band. Uh, the four trumpets became Andy Ross, and Andy Ross could do the shake of the, of the arrangement, you know, da, da. she sounded like the record, the Basie record, you know? And then, of course, John did all of the solo stuff, the tenor solos that made sense, and he wrote the lyrics. That was a, 
a complete left turn away from what it started out to be, the singer song of Basie. So. You know, in that period at ABC Paramount, there was this expression that starts to emerge, the new wave in jazz that became associated with impulse. Where did that phrase come from? Me. I just, it seemed like a, a good pitch. What's a new wave in jazz? You know? It's this. It's not, it's not Blue Note, and it's not Capital. It's ABC Paramount. Did you have any idea of what it m- meant, or it was just what you were digging, what the records you wanted to make, what was what sounding good to you? That was the new wave in jazz. I mean, how did you decide what records you wanted to make at that period? It wasn't because that was the password or whatever. I mean, the ID. It was uh, because what's a new wave in jazz? Well, it has to has to uh, be followed. Or the phrase that has to be followed with some, some concrete recordings. So we were not going to go in and, and, and do jazz at the Philharmonic or anything like that, or a swing band per se. We were going to do what we did. And that that would come under the heading of, on ABC Paramount, the new wave in jazz. It's the thing, it's only a pacey, uh, Zoot Sims uh, plays four tenors or whatever, you know. And you also seemed, once again, to be totally aware of the importance of the visual identity of the label in terms of being able to set yourself apart. You know, oh, Of course, yeah. I mean, were these all deliberate ideas that you were having about how to brand the label? Well, if you're asking me where the covers are deliberate, absolutely. It did such a variety of musical situations like drinking songs, college drinking songs. And drinking songs on uh, song under the table and da 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 da, and then World War One song, the World War Two song, flamenco. They were just areas that had not been fulfilled at the marketplace, and I, I was able to uh, get uh, like for the flamenco thing, uh, Sabicas or Montoya, you know. The root of a lot of what you ask me about was in a small record store across the street from the Paramount Building. This guy I got very friendly with, and he he would tell me customers come in asking for this, and I didn't have it. It sounds like a good idea to me. I'm going to go make a record, and it'll be in your store, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So you hear people are asking for something that doesn't exist. You're going to make it. Oh, of course, that's that's what I was there for. Were you out hearing music all the time at that period too? I mean, how did you become aware of you know? How did you know what was happening? Who you wanted to sign? Who you, rhythm sections that you wanted to work with, or players that you wanted to work with? Well, I was a fan. I was fascinated with the ins and outs of the marketplace, the quality of the disc, the presentation of the disc, and the get the co- cover aiming at the market that you made the record for in the first place, and then start calling the distributors. And and it, that would lead to, say, um, Stanley Turrentine. I'm, I'm now away from... you. Uh, the format at that period of time, I don't remember the dates of the exact years, but um, after midnight, black radio took over. And that's where I got the break for Stanley Turrentine, Freddie Hubbard, and, and a lot of... A lot of the uh, things that the the black uh, DJs had more latitude to play what they wanted to play after midnight, and then if they played it and they got a, a reaction. Then the station manager would move it up to the daytime, and if you get to get in the daytime, then you do the quantity uh, sales on it. So, well, I guess that's sort of the ultimate example of a crossover record, right? A record that kind of works it. in both markets. Sure. You were responsible for quite a few crossover records, but the one that may be closest to my heart, or one that is the closest to my heart, is the early Bossa Nova records, particularly Girl from Ipanema and the Getz Gilberto record. Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear your story about, about how that came together. Are you on the edge of your seat? As you can probably tell, I'm a big Bossa Nova fan, and I'm a huge fan of those Stan Getz records. The Girl from Ipanema is one of the biggest selling jazz albums of all time, and I still love it. What about you? When's the last time you heard The Girl from Ipanema? Visit third-story.com, leave me a note, and let me know. And now let's get back to Creed Taylor telling us how the whole thing happened. Stan Getz was signed to Verb, and as such, I got my... Oh, by the way, I discovered Stan Getz at Duke University. Walking along the campus, I don't know if you know the 
physical layout of Duke or no, whatever, I, go, I, Gothic I, architecture. And I, and I had a little portable radio. And there was a, a station in Durham that played, of all things, jazz. And I heard the original broadcast of Summer Sequence. And on Summer Sequence, it was early autumn. And on early autumn, a stand guest. And I already had made up my mind, I don't care what happens, I'm going to go record Stan Guess. Stan was up, I, I, I hadn't met him, of course, I was still a dude. But I was able to find out that he was a very volatile personality and uh, one should be careful in dealing with him. He's a one of a kind, an artist that uh, will never happen again. So now I met Stan in my office at MGM, or Verve, rather, and um, we talked and talked and came up with a sort of Finnegan idea for Focus. Focus is my title, but but uh, he wanted to do, do this um, without a rhythm section. It was a really off-the-wall kind of avant-garde uh, string section that he did this with, and, and I knew at the time that it had artistic merit and that we weren't going to sell mountains of sand gets focus but it got such and i knew it would get great reviews etc etc and it uh enabled me to when I, we got this tape from charlie bird on these uh brazilian songs you know so he he was sending tunes back to you that he found down there. well he uh, well, charlie bird had had yeah. uh, Cup just come back from Brazil where he heard all of the, the show beam songs, you know. And Charlie played it for Stan and myself. And I said, what do you think? I said, Stan and I had a solid relationship. I, I think it, it, we should give it a shot. Let's go down to Washington and record this thing. You never know, you know. He didn't know. I didn't know. But I, I knew that it was a very tricky uh, uh, song structure. That's All the Joe Beam songs. But... The Desafinado in the first place. The Desafinado means half, yeah, half wrong. Da ba da ba da ba da ba da da da. The flatted fifth. Yeah. So we recorded that and put it in a very colorful package and shipped it and boom. To, to make a long story short, because we had I, I I sent personally sent the the record to a. a, a stations disc jockeys that I knew around the country to, to give them a, for their market a premiere mm -hmm. for this album and they, they just you know, history an awful lot of coffee in Brazil you know that's that's it that's it she made it shipped it and it people liked it yeah if you hadn't taken that tape seriously and treated bossa nova as a music that deserved respect it could have easily been sort of lost to Brazil and, and the world would have not necessarily heard it. I mean, somebody had to decide to... Well, yeah, obviously. And, uh, the general uh, record business mentality would not look at that. I mean, it actually, the flatted fifth would have turned a lot of guys off. Uh, it's interesting that you say, you know, that that, was, that sort of followed a record that you knew was not a commercial record for Stan, but that you, you understood would have critical success, and it did. It was building um, a relationship, really. And obviously, if, if, I, if I'd made some dumb suggestions and it went that way, uh, that would be the end of the relationship. Yeah. But I, I couldn't go wrong doing the focus direction because that was unquestionable great musicality and then when we came up with this sort of i, I don't want to say something bad about the the bossa nova thing but it's kind of a mickey mouse ditty you know especially when you get to the desafinado part and uh stan went with it he would play anything we wanted to play. I, 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 I didn't steer him the wrong way, ever. And we had a great relationship. Relationship between Brazilian music, particularly, and American music, was so influential to me because it gave me a sense that, you know, you can take your sensibility and work with music from around the world and, and find something beautiful in, in the combination. Uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim was at this, uh, like, gathering for some 
piece of music that this photographer, I think he's a big photographer of Life magazine. Gil came to the, this, this party and Jobim came to this party and somebody introduced Jobim to uh, Gil. And Jobim came kimpering across the floor to Gil and kissed his feet. But the, th- the thing is, uh, Chet Baker, Jerry Mulligan, and uh, Gil Evans absorbed, they were absorbing the, the, the good people in Brazil, the good mm-hmm. musicians. Yeah. What was Antonio Carlos Jobim like to be around? What kind of person was he? Lively, enthusiastic. Never bitched about anything, and he drank a lot of uh, Heineken beer. Huh? Did Astrid become a singer really because she was she was just called to the session, kind of last minute? Yeah. Stan's wife went over and got her out of the hotel room. She'd come in with with all the other Brazilians, you know. She, she never made a record or anything. And into A and R Studios, I think it was Forty Sixth Street, between six and seven, and. Uh, was Phil Ramon set up a mic for her and kind of isolated over to the side so she wouldn't get nervous. And that was it. And a star was born. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whatever happened to her. She made records, but uh, guess what? <laughs> they weren't produced. And Astrid was, understandably, she was so uh, princess of the mountain that nobody could touch her, you know, mm-hmm. after the girl from Ipanema. And as far as the records, when she just went down the tube and nothing happened. How did you approach working with difficult artists? I mean, Stan was one of many complicated, one-of-a-kind artists that you worked with. Stan Getz obviously has a reputation for having been difficult, but many artists can be... Well, we recorded at Webster Hall, you know. And one of the dates, um, Stan got his back up, and it just started being really nasty, as Stan Getz could be, And I said, Stan, that's it. I'm going to go home now. You do whatever you want to do. If you want to come back tomorrow, you let me know. And, and But we're not going to record anymore today. Because the emotional atmosphere is just untenable. It's, and so the uh, following day, we came back and recorded. And it never happened again. Including, if you want to get on a plane and, and go to Washington and make a record, Whatever you want to do. I love Stan Getz. You studied psychology at Duke. Record production is so psychological in so many ways, having to manage the you know personalities of the different people involved, get it done, stay cool. Do you think an understanding of psychology, of having studied psychology, has had um, any... So subconsciously, so of course. It, 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 here, here's a... That we're on a subject of psychology is the incident that you probably have heard the story, but uh, Red Mitchell and who's the guitar player? Jim. Uh, Jim Hall. Yeah, Jim yeah. Hall. Jim Hall and Red Red Mitchell came in to Red had booked the studio at Rudy's. They stopped uh, one break and Red came in and walked over to Rudy's console, put his hand on a a knob, and Rudy said. Session's over. You can leave now. The door is right there. You don't owe me a thing. Just leave. And that was the end of the Red Mitchell and, and Jim Hall date. In other words, don't that's touch psychology. <laughs> don't touch Rudy's stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, don't. That's that's just don't do it. I mean, it was a, really a dumb thing to have happened. But anyway, it just seems like there was a period where it was just these projects and these people flying, you know, into your life and and you into theirs. And everybody with their own kind of craziness and needs and desires and, and artistry and all of that stuff. And you with both a desire to make great records and also a desire to sell great records. Mm-hmm. You know, this I think there's a lot of managing and holding of hands and, and the psychology of all of that. Oh, okay. yeah. It, it's certainly psychology at many, many levels. Eventually you... You went to A and M. It was A and M CTI for a couple of years, I guess. Huh? Yeah, and then uh, we split, and I, then I started CTI without the A and M part. When you first left Verve and went to A and M, it was kind of an opportunity to start fresh again, right, and and build something new. Well, the cliche is they made an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> Jerry and and, uh, and Herb. 
Herb, yeah. We'll give you your own label and uh, X dollars and uh, let's do it. And of course, they got the day of the life, Wes Montgomery. They got a hit. A big hit, big billing. Yeah. So what did you do when you went over there? They made you the offer you couldn't refuse and you went over there. Why did you decide to make the Wes record as your first record? What were the situation? Well, there had nothing to do with whether it was A&M or Impulse or whatever. You wanted to make a Wes Montgomery well, record? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, because I, I heard him with um, the Riverside. What it was doing with Riverside was just, I don't want to say pitiful, but the octaves were the whole power from a commercial standpoint. And um, in the studio, actually there's a picture of my talking to, to Wes. He he wasn't be deciding what he should do on the next phrase or the next part of the tune. And I said, don't worry about it, just play octaves. And he did. And there it went, you know. Nobody else could play octaves like that. The sound of those records really are identifiable in part because you started to introduce a lot of additional production elements you know you started to use strings and to do overdubs and to use i think some of the conventions of popular music as applied to jazz and instrumental music well i'm sure i was getting an education and and i was learning the ins and outs of using members of the new york philharmonic or klaus olgerman or don sebesky or oliver nelson i had a, a microphone in the uh, <coughs> conductor stand at rudy's and uh, it was connected to a, a a mic I had in the control room. So there are all kinds of things like uh, it was possible to do if you could, could communicate directly to the conductor, and he could be the bad guy, but not really being a bad guy. You know, like I never went into the studio to talk to any player or, or the conductor or whatever or the arranger, and I had a a booth part with with all the skeletal arrangement. Yeah. And I could say at the second bar, letter B, guess what? Something's funny. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up Don Sebesky because I think his arrangements were so foundational to the sound of CTI. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. What was the relationship like with Don Sebesky? Psychologically, he was very level-headed. We could talk over an arrangement, and uh, actually he came up with the idea of the first section session with, with uh, Wes w was tricky because w Wes had said quietly to Don and myself, uh, look, I can't read music. Here I am playing with all these top-notch string players and I can't read. I can't do this. So Don came up with the other, Wes, come over to Creed's office. We will go over everything on the piano, make a tape for you, which you will take on the road so you can rehearse in your hotel room and you'll know the thing back and forward, mm -hmm. you know? So that's the way from that point on, uh, Wes could walk in the studio with all of these fantastic musicians with great confidence because he knew the arrangement. By the way, when you after you left A&M and started CTI for yourself, it was a strong independent label it, it set the bar i think for a lot of people to come after that to think about how you could set up your own label and also your name was in the label so just like norman grants or anybody else who before you had put their name in the label your name was attached to the the image of of this music what led you to put your name in the in the name of the label i wanted to make sure that the responsibility of what came out as a record was attributable to me and not to somebody else and, and I, it, it helped uh, communicate with uh, the broadcast personnel, too. If I could uh, had a activity, sales activity on a particular album or single, I could pick up the phone and call whoever the managing director of the station or the disc jockey who happened to be playing it uh, and, and uh, react directly. With I'm, I'm the guy who did it. You're you're playing it, and I appreciate it, and da da da. And what do you think? Should I do the same thing again? Or you know, it, it's communication. Well, you had a lot of commercial success, like with the Grover Washington records, and you know, records that kind of opened the door to what later I think became called smooth jazz, or would become smooth jazz. Unfortunately. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. You say unfortunately, people sometimes 
group the records that you made in with the stuff that came later. And, and radio picked up on, on that stuff in a ill-conceived way. But at the time, radio was picking up on your records, too. I mean, you got airplay on instrumental hits. That Grover Washington had such a big hit with it, Mr. Magic, you know, which ha- I'll tell you this one thing. That I'm not going to have anything left in my book if I keep talking. Um, Roberta Flack had a date in Manhattan. It was uh, the drummer, Eric Gale, the bass player. Her rhythm section was uh, backing her on a record called Mr. Magic. And Eric made a tape of what they were doing. That was in the morning. In the afternoon, we had a Grover Washington date. And he played the tape. This is what she was doing. And I don't think what she was doing was right. This is Eric, you know. So, so he got, they did the arrangement over again in a different way with a better, funkier groove. And it was Mr. Magic, which was out of sight hit. You know. What effect do you think recording technology had on the music from the 50s through the 70s? How did technology of recording change the sound of the music? Uh, it was who was using the technology, not how did the technology. So if I were doing a date with Rudy, we'd talk about this thing, then he would do his interpretation. Now that's that's how, how it really worked. I can't think of any one thing that... Uh, Overdubbing, maybe. Well, yeah, overdubbing, sure. Do you check out the scene today? Do you hear records that are coming out or players today? Or I have the radio, and I've, I'm not exposed to the clubs that often. So. The world has changed so enormously. The record business has changed so, so tremendously, you know? There's no distributor now. There's nobody to buy it. There's nobody buying records, you know? It's a... But the big thing is the New York Times did a couple of days ago, vinyl. Did you read that? I did. Uh, I think that's an, a fantastic thing if it came to fruition and really made practical uh, market sense. I'm thinking about that. I agree with you. And I think what's wonderful about it is, you know, when you put on a record, you've got to put it on and listen for 20 minutes. And then you're going to decide if you want to hear the other side. But you have com- made a kind of a commitment to listen or you're going to have to get up again and turn the record off and... And when you're on the computer, it's easy to be distracted. And Oh, yeah. You know. well, the other thing is uh, the musicality, the sensitivity of the details of the sound that Rudy would put into an LP. You, could, you can't get it into a CD. You really can't. Well, a lot of people, well, come on, you know, with the advanced electronics that's going on today, I don't, yeah. it's not the same. So why did you stop producing so much? Why did you stop? The distribution fell apart. Space in the record stores disappeared. It just, a tremendous shift took place in the very point of sale for the music. So how do you get it going again? Maybe uh, in a more controlled version, the new vinyl thing may work out to be a really hidden uh, artistic thing, you know. When we who took this place in Florida, I went to this record store right in the middle of um, Pompano Beach. And this guy has nothing but vinyls. And the bulk of his vinyls, of course, are CTI stuff, you know. But he's got all kinds, just vinyl, vinyl, and people buy are buying the vinyl. So what does it feel like to walk into a record store that sells vi- mostly vinyl or nothing but vinyl and see, you know, CTI records, all, all your work sitting there? That, that's what's Say there. Say I mean, <laughs> uh, I can't do anything about it, but it's taken a turn now that uh, with that article. But I was also thinking, like, how does it feel to be here at this stage in your life and have seen so much history and made so much musical history, and when you walk into a record store, to to feel that you're still present, that your work is still important, that people still listen to it and, and value it? Well, I'd like to be able to walk into a record store, not just a vinyl record store <laughs> uh, yeah the, 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 the such good talent or a new talent coming along in the rhythm section and uh, and Rudy is still 
even though he has to take a rest on that, that does a rheumatic thing. He's still very active. And Sebesky's out there. Quincy's working like crazy. Quincy, well, he, he's he's hiding in Hollywood. <laughs> so the first guy I met when I came to New York. And we met at Charlie Stafford. Times change. Creed Taylor, thank you so much for taking time today. Well, there you have it, Creed Taylor, a man who spent his career at the crossroad of history and good taste. If you like this conversation, you might like to hear previous conversations with other record producers, including Matt Pearson, Tommy LaPuma, and Michael Lenhart, all of whom have their own personal approach to the way they make records. I'll be back in two weeks with another great conversation. <laughs>